African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as aviation, sports, business, literature, politics, education, and film. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is Bill Miles, a filmmaker, one who has done a number of wonderful things in films, particularly about African Americans. Bill, could you start out by telling us how you became involved in filmmaking? Well, that goes back uh, many years. I, as a kid, I lived uh, directly behind the Apollo Theater, mm -hmm. and uh, I used to run errands for the projectionist. Uh, lunch and things like that. And so while I was up there in the, in the booth, he used to show me how to splice films and rewind. And he, he sort of taught me how to thread the projector without actually touching it because he didn't want to get in trouble with the union. So uh, for me, I used to play with this stuff. And basically one day he said to me, he said, you know, you know enough about film. Why don't you go down and apply for a film inspector down on 57th Street? So I ventured down from my block on 26th Street down to 57th Street, and I joined a company called Sterling Films. And the main purpose of that organization was to inspect uh, what they call st standby films, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour films. And once the, the film was broken, I would repair it. So I worked there for many years, and finally I got the bug. I wanted to do my own film. And uh, that took a little time to do. Well, the, you, the little time to do, you've done so many remarkable projects mm -hmm. in your career. But I'm interested in how you evolved. Now there are film schools and people who want to uh, learn to make films like Spike Lee, go to the NYU Tisch School or mm -hmm. go to UCLA or go to USC. And they actually train in the areas of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You learn this from the ground up. Right. Now, what are some of the things that you learned that helped you to be well, able to make these wonderful films? Well, a as an example, uh, it, it was like on-the-job training. Uh, you had to know how many feet was in uh, uh, 16 millimeter equals a minute, and you have to know uh, how many uh, feet in, 90, uh, in 35 millimeter that equaled a minute, and things like that. So part of the job was like uh, inspecting the film and also realizing if someone had clipped a piece out of there, you had to report it and then replace the footage. So I was always touching the film. And basically all the film I was working on was silent films. Uh, D.W. Griffith's estate, uh, it was an amazing amount of footage, stuff going back to 1890 and things like that. So I, I, I really loved that, uh, Valentino Cha Chaplin and stuff like that. So, uh, after working there for many years, I decided, gee, you know, I need to do one of my own, so it took some time. So you learned how to use the camera. Now, what about the lighting? Because lighting and sound are so much a part of modern film. Well, you know, that's, what's, what's crazy about that, I never had to uh, worry about the camera work. I had a friend, uh, a guy named James uh, Dick Adams, who at the time when I met him, we both realized that we wanted to be filmmakers. And he was always running around with his eight millimeter, and I had an eight millimeter camera, which I was always shooting scenes out of my uh, third floor window uh, in a, on 126th Street. So I was sort of bitten by, by the bug by shooting f scenes like that until one day, I'll never forget this, my mother said, give me that camera, because I said, what's the matter? She said, you just documented a, a payoff uh, <laughs> out in the alleyway right there. So I, I said, I said, gee, Miles, you know, like I just wanted to, take these shots but she said no you get in trouble so she put it away but uh, uh, great things happened many years later my mother gave me back that old camera and then I started looking through the old footage that I sh had shot in, uh, on that block there and it, it's like historical pieces now it's well being uh, behind the Apollo you must have seen yeah. every major African-American celebrity of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Right, definitely. And in fact, uh, even better than that, during the summer, I had a, a job there during the summer, uh, sort of a, a cleaning up backstage, which gave me the opportunity to see this, the 
backstage operations, the, the stage hands, the dressing rooms and things like that. And I was always amazed that the, it, the star room was so tiny. I mean, you has got like, uh, let's say Billy Eckstein would show up and he had this little tiny room. You know, you just couldn't imagine the star of the show being in such a tiny space. But I went back there uh, maybe about three months ago and I walked through the Apollo backstage again and it looks even smaller now, but anyway, it's still there. The law of comparative right. judgments. You were younger then. <laughs> right, exactly. Now, your work is mainly focused on doing documentaries about African Americans. How do you go about choosing the topic and then how do you go about researching it and developing it into a full-fledged film? Well, basically, I like to d dig up things that's either little known or unknown to most people. And I found out uh, we have so much uh, past history that has not been done, really, that uh, we need to start digging, going back further and, and pulling all of that information out of the books and wherever it's being kept. Uh, images are always a, a thing with me, was that I, I believe that if you talk about it, show people what it looks like. As an example, I, I was on a bus uh, some years ago and I heard a lady trying to explain to her son who Jackie Robinson, what he looked like. And uh, the kid had no knowledge of what Jackie Robinson looked like. And I kept, I'm listening to the conversation, I kind of say to myself, she was now, if we, d we don't have the images of Jackie Robinson in his head, you know, what images do we have? Uh, which is the type of thing I always wanted to do. Is, and uh, uh, once someone had said that uh, we didn't have any black astronauts, well, I did a film called Black, uh, Black Stars in Orbit. I just want to prove a point that we not only had one, we had about mm -hmm. seven black astronauts in the system, including a young lady, uh, Mae Jameson, Mae Jameson, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mae Jameson, and that uh, uh, just recently, the, the 28th of uh, January, I believe, it, the, the Challenger incident uh, had taken place. Well, uh, Someone wanted to find out whatever happened to the park that was supposed to be named after Dr. Dr. McNair. M McNair. Well, I happened to document it that the day that they had the presentation of it, the, the street sign, but never used it. So I'm always saying that now that there goes a subject you can go back to and show people that, you know, almost 10 years ago this was proposed, but it was never done. and. The, He's a hero of ours that we need to mm -hmm. let people know about. So. Now, much of your work has been with the public station Channel 13. Yes. And I believe one of the first pieces you did was about the 369th Infantry. Is that, was that the first piece you did for the 13th? Yes, it was, uh, it took 12 years. Uh, I had Were you a patient man? <laughs> 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 the thing about that project is that I had given it up after about the ninth year or so, and uh, I just said, gee, you know, I'll never get to do this project. So I turned it over to another guy who I thought, you know, was going to get in there and start working. About a year later, I hadn't heard from him, and nor was he interested in doing anything about, about it. So I went back and retrieved all my material and just, just set out to do it, and uh, after 12 years of working on that project, it was finally produced and uh, played on Channel 13. Uh, it's played all over the world. Oh, yeah. The title of the film is Men of Bronze, and I believe it won a New York Film Critics Award, yeah. and is uh, really one of the ways in which we know about the remarkable exploits of these African Americans fought in World War II. So let's take a moment now and uh, see a clip from Men of Bronze. New York City. Soldiers of the 369th New York National Guard parade up Fifth Avenue. Many of these men are the sons and grandsons of the old New York 15th Infantry, the Harlem Hellfighters. 
who became famous in France as the 369th, the old rattlesnake regiment. A veteran of World War I remembers how he and 2,000 others volunteered to join this regiment. The first black American combat troops to fight on French soil. He also remembers how his regiment marched up Fifth Avenue while thousands of New Yorkers cheered. you can see that the Men of Bronze episode is something that African Americans have been proud of uh, literally for decades and you made it possible for young African Americans to uh, have this to see as you say and understand and then you have done another film on black sports heroes what do you call that film uh, the, the project was called uh, black champions uh, it really dealt with all types of sports that uh, African Americans were involved in from fencing to track and field, boxing, the whole works. And uh, I had a really great time meeting those champions because somehow they did not uh, appear the, the way I thought they would be. I mean, they were great gentlemen and ladies and, and it was uh, a joy to be around them. And uh, uh, as an example, Figure uh, Leonard uh, was supposed to be interviewed in Washington, D.C. and we showed up with all the equipment and everything. We get down there, and the doorbell rings, and there he is right on time, which was unusual. <laughs> and he said, okay, guys, let's do it. And that type of atmosphere it was, was really great. So I met Althea Gibson, uh, uh, the big O, Oscar Robinson, people like that, Jim Brown. Let's take a moment and look again at a clip from uh, Black Champions. American sports legends, men and women of extraordinary will and uncommon ability, whose powerful competitive urge has lifted them beyond the pale of what once seemed possible. Pioneers who crossed the color line first, setting precedents for opportunities in other walks of life. Producers of wealth and paragons of style, individuals who fulfill the highest potential of the group, icons of a race. Coming up, Black Champions. Throughout the 20th century, in ballparks and coliseums across the United States, champions have been worshipped. America's championship season is endless, and in their time, for decades, for generations, champions define the heroic gesture as an element of personal style. For fans, adulation is timeless. Cheering, the sound that never ends. For the fans, the champion endlessly reappears, bearing their colors to the field of honor. When the first myths were yet in the making, the black champion inhabited a pantheon of park, exiled there by social convention. Proud and presumptuous, he would not remain there long. The black champion would have his tribute, and in full measure. Yeah, it's wonderful to see those athletes in their prime because particularly when we were younger, we saw them in their prime. Mm -hmm. The younger people hear about them, but don't see them in their prime. And that visual image helps them to put it in some kind of perspective. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the research on that took about at least three years to locate those different little clips. 
uh, which is kind of fascinating when you find Well, how do you do that? I've, I've well, often wondered I, I, if you have I, a 10-second <laughs> clip of Babe Ruth or something like that, and you probably have to spend six months to find it. it, it at least you, you get in uh, touch with other collectors throughout the country, uh, people who might have uh, had their own home movies, mm -hmm. and just call out and write people and do everything that's possible. I used to have a, some wild things. I put in a newspaper that I'm looking for photographs of Jack Johnson. And I get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning, some guy in Brooklyn saying, that, hey, come on, I got a, a bunch of shots. Of this. And when you get these, you get newspaper clippings rather than a photo. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, But if you don't go, you never know what's on the other end. Actually, I, I, I think it was 13, one of the channels took some of the old footage that the baseball players took during spring training and during the season and put a Caesar series out when it was a game. <laughs> and it's enjoyable to watch. <laughs> Basically, with your Black Champion series, you have the same thing for the African American community. Right. Now, what has been the impact of these programs on African American youth in particular? Do many schools use them? Do you get many letters about these programs? Uh, I, we get letters, we mean in uh, Channel 13, they, they get letters from school kids, uh, uh, associations, uh, veterans groups, uh, all sorts of civic groups and asking for more. Um, I'm willing to do more, you know, but uh, money always dictates, you know, what really comes Yeah, how out. do you get the funding for your project? Well, it's uh, basically, I had a, a situation at uh, Channel 13 that was independent of the station and I would bring a project to the station and uh, they look it over and uh, the exec, they would assign an exec on the project and if they thought it was worthwhile they would pass it on to the marketing department which would go out and try to raise the money. And uh, One time it was like if I could raise 25 percent of the money they would find the other 75 mm -hmm. and it's kind of flipped a little bit now but uh, it's not as easy as it used to be. But I had a, a great executive, uh, a fellow by the name of David Loxton, who was really, really super mm -hmm. guy to, to work with. And he, he kind of made sure I could go from here to there without any problem. See, with the emergence of cable and channels like the History Channel, much of what you have been doing has been taken to a high level. Yeah. And they have more money for production, they sell ad advertising, et cetera. Because you're in the documentary field, particularly with a public station, it's a lot more difficult to raise the capital. But it would seem to me that someone like you, with all of your skills and all of your archives, ought to be able to raise uh, a considerable capital to put together many of these pieces so that there's a link. There's a link between the discrimination that we faced in the military, the discrimination we faced in sports, the uh, discrimination we faced in the entertainment industry. That could be linked together in a, uh, in a broader frame. Mm -hmm. I know that it takes money, but I know you also have some interest in that. As a matter of fact, I think you're working on a project now about an uh, African-American who's about to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for his activities in World War I. Right, and, and it's a guy named is Sergeant Henry Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, this month, February, is the 80th anniversary of those soldiers marching back from uh, Europe. Uh, the parade took place uh, on Fifth Avenue. In uh, February. February the... E even though the war ended in November yeah. of 1918, right. the parade welcoming them back, right. back didn't happen until February of 1919. Right, and it was the longest parade, by the way, from 23rd Street to 145th. Really? It's, it, with two reviewing stands, uh, it's, it's a great story about how that all That's came the Men of Bronze, the 369, right. the Hall of Harlem Health Fighters, marching up Fifth Avenue, right, all the way to 145th, what, to the Armory? Uh, yes, uh, up in that area yeah, before the Armory was really pulled together. That's but, really uh, fantastic. The, the thing is, and, and it turns out to be, I tracked down his son, Henry Johnson's son, would you believe his Henry Johnson's son is a Tuskegee Airman? Is that right? That's right. As and you know, I was a Tuskegee Airman. You're right, right. That is really fantastic. Right. So, uh, you know, that keeps going on. 
now how are you going to do what are you going to do in this film are you going to talk about the exploit or are you going to talk about the discrimination that caused him not to get the medal or I, I, both i want to pull it all together um, in, including uh, you know how he lived and what happened to him when he came back because that that's very what did important. happen to him when he came back well it turns out to be that he was he was a, he became a spokesman for veterans and he went down to washington there to trying to lobby for some support from the all the, the guys, everybody, and he was always, you know, being turned down. But here's a guy that had something like twenty some odd uh, wounds in his body, body, and he could not believe it. So that takes uh, some wear and tear on. Now, what was the circumstance that caused him to win the Congressional Medal of Honor and be considered for it? Well, uh, well, actually, what he did was that. He, him and one other friend, uh, his, uh, this guy's name was uh, Needham Roberts, uh, fought off 20 some odd Germans hand to hand combat. Uh, because of where they were uh, uh, positioned in the trenches, they alerted the rest of the body of the men. Uh, otherwise, they could have been just overran. But that's what happened. And uh, who was a uh, famous Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt. said that. Uh, if there were six heroes in the world, Henry Johnson was one of them. And yet he never no, received the no. Congressional Medal of Honor. No. Uh, more, more recently, in the past year or so, uh, some men from World War II yeah. finally received the yeah. Congressional Medal of Honor. Right. And the general feeling is it was discrimination right. that caused them not to uh, receive it. And that's where your films come in. They help to pull the sure. cloak of secrecy off of some of the events and exploits of African Americans. What about politics? Have you done much in politics in your films? Oh, not not really. Why? Uh, uh, only because uh, the, the the material is hard harder to obtain. It's like uh, mm. to me it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, if I talk to one person about anything, there's another person that said he should have came to me to. Uh, because I knew more about it than he did. So you've never, you haven't done anything no. on Martin Luther King no. per se. No. Oh, okay. I'm glad you brought that up. About two years prior to Dr. Martin Luther King's holiday, I went down to Atlanta with a proposal to do a piece on Dr. King, and I was given permission by uh, Coretta King, Mrs. King, to come down and do some research. But something happened. They got in the way, and it was, um, uh, I think it was Ted Turner was going to be doing something mm -hmm. about it. So I never had the opportunity to, to do this. But I wanted to do a film about Dr. King as a kid. What was, what was that all about? Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity. I went down. I shot some footage of uh, his sister telling him how he used to hated, he hated to play the piano. But he had to take lessons. And then she said, see those dents in the keys? He used to beat the <laughs> keys. So, you know, I, I thought that was a very human interest story that people need to see. Put oh, humanity yeah. uh, into a hero. Right, right, right. Um, of course, Henry Hampton won several major awards oh, for his yeah. civil rights documentary. And of course, that was a very yeah. well-funded project. Yeah. As you look to the future in terms of what you would like to have happen, with your archives, with your films, et cetera, what would you like to see happen with the Miles work? Well, basically, it, it, I guess it's the same way I, f I felt when I was a kid, that uh, uh, images of uh, the African Americans seem to be, you know, n not that many much out there, as much as it should be. And uh, I would want to make it possible that all the images that I have collected all these years mm -hmm put into some good use in the schools, in the homes, wherever it's possible to, to say one day like 2090, here we were. Mm -hmm. well, that's something that's really worthwhile looking forward to. And that's doable with the computer imaging now, uh, with the various other technologies. You can put these together. I guess the only thing it takes is resources. Yes. Yeah. And then the question is, how do you get the resources? Right. You have to get foundation. You have to right. get supporters, et cetera. Uh, but also, there is a commercial benefit to this. I imagine that uh, people who are now producing films about 
African mother and Americans and others uh, really would want to acquire these. And I know there are some commercial houses, <laughs> but as I understand it, Bill Miles has about as much of this material as anybody around. Maybe more. <laughs> now, I, I, you, you talked a little about how you get it. You put an ad in the newspaper, et cetera. Are you still collecting material? Oh, yes. I, I always collect. And not only that, I think there's people out there that understand me that we're, who might have a collection will call me up and say, Bill, listen, you know, I'd like to make a deal with you to get my collection because you're the only one that's doing things with it. And that's how, it, it's amazing who calls up and who has things. So I, I always kind of say, well, you know, I w I'll take care of it in, in a sense by doing that. Another project you might be interested in is something about black scientists. You uh, did uh, 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 blacks in orbit. Right, what about right. black scientists? Can I, can I almost tell you that that is one of the big projects I would love to do. I, I even have the title of the film. Ready? You want to yeah. hear this? Yeah. From slave ship to spaceship. Those contributions in between mm -hmm. those two elements Beautiful. are unbelievable. Yeah. Well, that's why Bill Miles is such a fantastic filmmaker. You have a lot of imagination. You have a tremendous amount of persistence. And you have some support. I think many people in the African American community know about your work and appreciate your work. And I'm very pleased that uh, we've been able to talk with you. Uh, what advice would you give to other people who want to go into the film business? Uh, just uh, stick with that idea and it, have faith in what you're doing. Have faith in what you're doing. Exactly. Uh, we've been talking with Bill Miles, filmmaker, on today's African-American legends.